Greetings and welcome to the Listen to Your Footsteps podcast. I'm Koja Buffer and this podcast is an extension of my book by the same name. In the book, Listen to Your Footsteps, I share in a collection of essays, anecdotes and poems some of the lessons life has taught me on loss, identity, fatherhood, work and everything in between. Having also worked in various parts of the media industry, one of the things I've always appreciated has been the opportunity to also get a peek into the lives and paths that other people have taken. This podcast is an opportunity for me to continue to learn from others and hopefully let you, the listeners, also gain from their wisdom. My guest this week is Dumi Morake, who's a comedian, an actress, a writer, a producer, a mother and a wife. She's also a friend to have had the opportunity to work with on a reality show called She's the One. In this conversation, we chat about comedy, radio, constant learning, amongst other things. I hope you enjoy. Okay, so thank you for coming on to this this weird journey that I'm on. Thanks for having me, Kojo. How many jobs do you have? That's what I want to start. Let's start with <laughs> how many jobs do you have or how many projects are you working on right now? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. That got me completely off guard. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have. That gives, you, um, that, gives, that gives you a little time to start counting in your head, right? <laughs> <laughs> it does. I have about three or four. Which are? <laughs> so, so, I work in. Yeah, so I'd forgotten, right? So I'd forgotten that you're on radio. Yes, I'm on radio. And I write, I'm currently writing a series for a big um, streaming service. I <laughs> am in production for a film. And I also am on a board of directors. I sit on a board of directors for my school. Um, yeah, that's that's about for the now. ones I can... Oh, I also do another podcast... Um, with the BBC called The Cultural Frontline. And yeah, I think that's about it. And then I'm an influencer once in a while. Yeah, on the social. And then the corporate stuff. Oh, yes. And I do a lot of corporates. Yes, I still do stand up comedy on the corporate scene. Um, I haven't done live in a while. It hurts my feelings. But yes, I do that as well. <laughs> and I raise children. <laughs> so this is the thing that's always fascinated me about you because I mean, we've known each other for a while. It yeah. is you are always doing a lot of stuff. Where, where does that come from? Like, where does that, that, whether it's a drive or a, whatever, whatever you define it as, where does it come from? This, this desire or this drive or this feeling that you need to be doing something. I'm hoping that one day I'm going to go, so this one is my passion. <laughs> um, Cause I have, varying diff uh, interests in the different things I do uh, besides money. And there are some that get a lot of attention because in that moment, they're like the big money draw, but I still love it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I'm trying to find if I have a singular passion or if I just love anything that connects me to people. Um, and it's also because, you know, when I was in university, it was the first time I was exposed to so many facets of entertainment and arts and how it works so ever since then I've also had this curiosity of so which ones can I do well and yeah so that's what I've done uh, also because I've never believed in the concept of a starving artist and so I go I went to university spent money my mother never really had to get this thing the least I can do is make it work for me. So a lot of the stuff I do is also stuff that I learned and I'm like, I may as well put this to practice. You know? so, I mean, you, you study drama, right? Yeah, I studied drama. How did you get to that? I mean, a, a young girl from Tavanchu going, actually drama. Uh, so how did you get, how did you get to the drama? And you're saying um, you, you, you spent money your mother didn't have. What was that yeah. conversation like? Yeah. So I I had always been artistic and I loved I loved that. 
you know, I passed maths and science and biology so I could pass. I didn't pass them because I enjoyed them. Mm. I thrived in languages. I thrived in history class, you know, and so I thrived in Afrikaans. I enjoyed it. So I knew that I like communicating and I like playing because I'm playful by nature. It's my personality. So I went, um, you know, when it was time to be applying to schools, I looked at what everybody had. And I found this one varsity that had everything I wanted, and that was vets. And so I applied to one university for two different degrees. My thinking being, they can't reject me on all fronts. So I applied for um, fine arts and I applied for dramatic arts. And I got accepted to both because, you know, trust a girl to pass like that. <laughs> and <laughs> then I got there and I realized, Sure, I love drawing and I love painting. I can do that in my free time. Performance, on the other hand, because mm. I've seen people make magic. Like, I loved TV. I was that couch potato child who you just put in front of the TV and wants to know how a thing was done, like puppets. You know, I wanted to know why I can't see puppets walking past me in the streets, but I see them on TV all the time. Um, and I actually learned puppetry. Like, I'm a trained puppeteer. <laughs> I didn't just, yeah, it That's wasn't just big... empty interest. I was just watching it. I was just, I was basically watching a video, you know, in, I think it's in Rosebank or around the Afri Mark, Africa market where they have those puppets yeah. dancing. The string puppets. Yeah. yeah. The string puppets dancing. So you yeah. said that and I immediately thought about those guys with the, with the puppets dancing. Yeah. That's the next skill I should learn. I haven't learned string puppeteering. Okay. So I know very, I, I do, I do the hand puppeteering very, mm. very well. Um, I did that for a few years, actually, doing shows in schools, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so, yeah, so uh, my mom was just excited that I was going to university. That was the big deal for her, mm -hmm. you know. And so she actually was not concerned what I'm going to study. She was just like, you're going to varsity. That's all that matters to me. You're going to come home with a degree. That's what matters to me. You're going to be reading and studying. And she loved that. My mother was a huge fan of education. So... We applied for a bursary, um, you know, we try to make this thing happen. And unfortunately, because of her salary, apparently, I mean, this was a single mother raising two children and I didn't qualify because they're like, no, we can only give you half of the bursary because according to what your mother's earning, she should be able to pay your varsity fees. Wow. And so that became the challenge. You know, I ended up getting kicked out of university because, I mean, she, by the third year, I was in huge debt. And so I left school and worked to pay that debt. After paying that debt, I went back to finish my final year. And um, what work did yeah. you do in that period? In that period, I went into telemarketing. I was a PA for a guy who owned one of those um, Liberty franchises. Mm -hmm. I was a dinosaur in the malls, entertaining kids. Um, <laughs> yeah. And while I was doing that, I was attending these free workshops they'd have um, at SABC. They'd be like these writing workshops and whatever. So I'd go and do that. Eventually, I got a job at this place called Arab. And we would mm. do, that's where we were doing shows for schools. And, you know, we'd go and do these live shows, educational shows about AIDS, bullying, uh, sex education, mm. all of that stuff. Um, and I loved it because again, now I'm getting, you know, I'm doing what I love, which is performing, learning new skills, facilitating uh, conversation between teachers and learners. I really enjoyed it. Like I did stuff that felt meaningful to me, you mm. know, and all the while, every break I got, I would go and attend these things and half the time I'd be broke. So you go to these things, you like, I'm praying this coffee and scones so that I can eat that day. But it, I look back at stuff like that and I'm like, yo, Tooms, when you want something, you go in, eh? <laughs> but it's like, me, an, it's, I mean, it, it, it's like you created your own internship or apprenticeship. Yeah, you exactly. Took, you, took advantage, you took advantage of not being able to pay for school fees to go and <laughs> intern. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, became, <laughs> I like it. I interned. I, I had my own internship program yeah. that I drew up. Uh, and also in that time, then I, I toyed with stand-up comedy. And I'm so glad I toyed with it when it wasn't a desperate thing that I needed to get right. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, yeah. So by the time it became that, I was at least decent at it. And Because it always feels like, I guess when we, it's like when, when the bio is written, 
or when the conversation yeah. is had, it's okay, at this moment, you know, at this moment, she became a comedian. At this moment, she did this. And at this moment, <laughs> she did that. Uh, not recognizing that sometimes you you are laying the foundation for it as you go. Yeah, yeah. I think it all happened organically because as my stand-up career was growing, I was learning, I was writing. I was already writing in television, right? I had um, I'd already done my so-called internship with um, a production company and I was and I'd already studied writing at school. So now by the time I was getting into stand-up, I knew how to write. Now it was a matter of how do I perform what I write? Mm-hmm. And I was writing because I was writing sitcom and I'm a chubby, light complexion girl with no archetypal look, no archetypal features. It was hard for me to get cast in anything. So I started writing and okay. create, if I was given a character, I'd create a character I knew I could play. So that by the time we're doing read throughs, they're going, but to me, you should also audition for this. And I'd be like, yeah, turks. <laughs> 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 and then end up getting the role. <laughs> <laughs> because I wrote it. Of course, I'm going to know it better than anyone else who's trying out for it. Um, so what, that's that's how I, I mean, was What's the... It's a weird thing, because so one of my things I always try to figure out, uh, I'm fascinated by how things work. Um, so just in terms of the writing, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're writing, you're writing multiple characters. Um, what's, mm-hmm. you know, what's your process in terms of that element of the craft and then being able to write write for yourself but you're writing a character who is not you Mm. but Mm. you still need to incorporate enough for it to make sense when you audition for it like those 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 feel like two very different very different skills I, i find that when you write for characters they live in your head and you know how they sound you know because I've always written collaboratively. So when we're creating these characters and you, you know, the, the, the writers start to agree on certain personality traits of this character, you start to hear them speak, you know, and they don't speak the same. It's almost like when you think about a family meeting you had or the last time you hung out with your friends, your memory of them will always come in different voices. They will mm. never sound the same. There's a difference in speed, difference in speech and in, in pitch, difference in the kind of words they choose to use. So when I would write for my characters, I'd always inject a bit of me in them. Mm. I would inject my kind of sass. I would inject, and also language. I'd make sure the language isn't too restrictive. I remember when I got myself into his also connection and I was like, this is Zulu. I don't speak any Isi Zulu. Mm. Uh, Zulu is something I learned when I got to Joburg. And so the way I wrote the character is she's this free state character who is just trying to, like, she's hustling her way into Joburg. So she will speak Isi Zuto, which is what you find that a lot of people who are Basutu and Baswana yeah. who are not from Joburg, will ins- they, they can't help but learn the language. You have to. The, I don't feel like Joburg forgives you if you don't speak your Zulu. You must know Zulu to survive. Mm. And so that's how I set up that character. And that's how I got that character. So that even when I did speak Zulu, Zulu people weren't being offended and going, who's this woman who is tearing our language apart? They're going, mm. this is bloody hilarious. I love it when the Sutras try and speak our language. They sound like babies. Ah, ah, ah. And so, and so that, that worked for me. <laughs> so, so when you came out of university, did you jump straight into like the writing work? Yeah, did you lay that foundation already? Yeah, look, I got kicked out, right? And I've, Spent about a month feeling sorry for myself and going, woe is me? What's going to happen to me? And then I, um, I just, I kept auditioning for the stuff at school anyway, because mm. what you'd find is the seniors would be allowed to cast outside the university. So I would go and just keep auditioning for those final year projects because I was aware that um, agents would come and watch especially the final year projects or the main, whatever main feature they'd be that year. Mm. They were always like, and I needed an agent. I knew if I want to work because I was like, come on, not every actor went to school. Not every actor is a graduate. So I believed I could at least get that. Um, So there was that. There was sleeping on people's couches and beds and squatting with people at university. Um, And, uh, oh, at some point I was uh, selling toilet paper in... (laughs) In job right you know those 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 uh people who have to sit there and like 
encourage you to buy this yeah. brand of toilet paper, <laughs> not the other brand. So I'll be the spokesperson for your bottoms to say your bottoms will prefer this, you know. And <laughs> so I did a bit of that. It was actually quite a humbling experience. Like I was ready to do anything. If if an opportunity to be a domestic worker had come, if it meant I'd have a, a salary every month that allows me to stay in Joburg, I would have taken it. Mm. So, and so that's what happened. But I was very, I was incredibly blessed in that Penny Charteris saw me and she liked me. And so she took me on. And that's how I ended up getting the gig uh, doing the theater work in schools, which was a building thing for me as well, you know, because it improved my communication skills. I learned puppeteering in that time and um, I got to act. I got to work on my craft. I got to perform. Um, I got to direct by the time I left that company, I'd been directing the shows. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm always like, I believe in upskilling myself, you know, and I really think that's the thing that, uh, that's gotten me so far is I'm never above learning, which is actually how I landed in radio because I always feel like it's never too late to learn a new skill. And if Absolutely. I'm bad at it, guess what? I get to walk away. I'm not a tree. Mm-hmm. I can leave. Yeah, it's it's, it's being able to separate the... I don't know whether it's failure, but separate the, okay, this is not for me, from Mm -hmm. me as a human being. Uh, The problem problem is that for a lot of people, it's it's one and the same thing. So if you, you, in inverted commas, fail at something, then you are a failure. Where it's just like, I tried it. Okay, it's not for me. It didn't work. I'm good. I'm going to go try something else. Yeah. It's like throwing a balloon. mm, I took it like blowing a balloon. You know, when you blow a balloon too hard and then it pops. Yeah. Right? The balloon has popped, but you're still there and you still yeah. got breath. So there's many other balloons you can blow until you get it right. <laughs> and, sometimes, and sometimes you blow and you don't get it right. You have to let the air out to start again. Yes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think I think you were coming up in a very interesting era because, I mean, I, in in one of my lifetimes, I was working at an actor's agency. Um, at contractors, yeah. I was a booker. No, yeah, I was a booker for close to two years. It's like 2000 and, 2001, 2002, I think till 2003. Wow. And what was interesting was so that was the that was starting to the come, come to the back end of a lot of people who got onto television because TV had finally opened up for black people. Mm. And, and they were just taking anybody. And so you had you had people who hadn't studied but were gifted and learned on the job. Mm. Uh, but around that era, like I remember at the agency, people started getting asked, like, what can you do? Can you sing, act, dance? So if you could do, if you could do, if you could do like musical theater, if you could do the singing, you could do the acting, you could do the dancing, um, it was easier for you to get work. Because mm because there was such an influx of people who hadn't studied and everybody was like, I can be an actor because they were seeing people on television. And so like the, you know, what you're talking about with Arab. And I remember sending a lot of people to that where it's, you know, it's, it's musical theater. It's it's, uh, the guerrilla mark, you know, the guerrilla theater going Mm. in and in those days, Mm. HIV AIDS going into communities Mm. And, and mm-hmm. there's so many people from that era that I'm fascinated by, like I watch now because of where they are um, yeah. Yeah. And, and how their journey has, has kind of transformed. So yeah. it looks like, I mean, you are coming up, I think, in a very interesting era, in an interesting time. Yeah. 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 So let's shift to the, so the comedy. When, so I remember at poetry sessions, at open mics, uh, people like, David Gau, I don't, I don't think David said now. David got his start in like poetry stages, even though he always disses poets. <laughs> when did you decide, okay, this is another avenue that I'm going to pursue? I mean, that's kind of where you got your prominence from, but th- like I'm going to pursue it beyond just the, uh, I can do it. Sure. Um. I don't, I don't know, because, you know, uh, in my first year at university, uh, that's when I first saw live stand-up comedy. 
and I figured it's something I could do. I was like, this feels like something I could do. It just, it, something in me just became unsettled, like wanting, you know, when you when there's that thing and you're pulling it back, going, hey, you went, where are you going? What do you want? But it was like this hound dog that mm. wants this thing, but I didn't understand this thing and um, left it at that. I just knew I had a sense of humor. Um, I'd been told I have comic timing in theater space, you know, when we were working, like my, uh, my lecturers would often encourage me to be trying out for the comedies because they were like, yo, you have, you have incredible comic timing and understanding of how comedy works. Um, and I think that's the thing that made me fall in love with the English language because I love how you can just mess with words. Um, and then, um, yeah, I auditioned for a fourth year student who had written stand-up comedy and she said she was looking for stand-up comedians. She had three scripts. All I saw was scripts. I was like, ah, I've always been curious about this comedy thing. Now somebody else has written it and I can just jump on and do mm. it. I'm in. So I jumped on. I did that. It helped me understand structuring thought in comedy because that's what I didn't quite get. Because, you know, there are guys who genuinely just get up and talk smack and that's their stand-up. But I, I really enjoyed stuff that looks impromptu but has been well prepared. And so I learned that and I started doing that. And in 2006, I decided to, to do proper open spot publicly because now I'd been performing in a controlled space, which is school. And then I'd done a couple of corporates, which they were corporates, but I mean, it's your father's company. So, you know. <laughs> They're going to laugh. Yeah. And then, <laughs> um, not my father's, by the way, I mean the people who were writing the stand up. So when I got to get a real audience and really get the nerves in, and in fact, my first experience of that was 2005 or four, four, where we did a public show at school for Rotary. And poor my, my husband got these guys to come in. Uh, professionals like your David Gauker, uh, another comic from Cape Town, can't remember who, Joey Rustin. And then he said, babe, jump on, just do like five minutes. And I was like, all I have is five minutes. Like there's, not, yeah. there's nothing else I could offer you anyway. And I was like, okay, if as long as I go on right at the beginning, because now you've called in the pros, you know, and I did it and I got such a great response, you know, but then you believe it's fluke, you know, those mm. self-sabotaging thoughts. I was like, it's fluke, whatever. Never looked at it again until 2006. And I went and I did my first open spot and it was decent, you know, uh, cool runnings. And then I went on to go to Brakban and no one laughed, but they thought I was great. And then I went back and I killed. And that time I'm thinking, surely I'm not good at this thing. But if this guy's going to pay me because he thinks I was great and I'm thinking I died, then there must be something there. Granted, my first time in Brackbine at Carnival City, it was in front of like last end of, you know, those end of the month crowds who are drunk yeah, and yeah. they've just watched the tits and ass show. So they're not interested in you, you know? Um, but there was a moment in that first five minutes where I'd grabbed them and then I left. So I just thought, I, this is not for me. And then I went back and I completely destroyed that room like obliterated and then uh, that's when I was like okay this is something I could do and my set started getting longer and longer and longer and longer you know and I knew that this is it and I think what really gave me confidence in that time was that I would compete with guys and I would see them get unsettled because mm. usually when there was a girl trying out they were unperturbed mm. you know but when I started to see that oh okay wait I can, I'm actually competing with you guys. I'm not just some girl on stage. I'm playing on your level. I was like, this is something for me. I also love the confidence it gave me. Because you know, when you audition for stuff, not getting the role isn't necessarily that you didn't have the skill. It could be, yeah, but you're chunkier than what they wanted, you know, or you're not quite that thing they want. Mm -hmm. Whereas with stand-up comedy, you are giving them you. You're not giving the audience a choice. You're saying, this is me. And then you're giving them this offering and their laughter is the validation and the payment that you need really. So it was very easy for me to go. This is the thing I want to do because I didn't even know it could pay me well initially, to be honest with you. I was making at my first corporate, I got 1.5, you know, and I was like, ah, it's easy money in a few minutes, but I mean, I must still go and have my job in writing, but it got to a point where now I had to step back from writing because the stand-up comedy was running away with me mm. and I, I didn't have time, 
you know, to focus on the writing. I needed to focus on my performance. And, and that's when I knew this was a, 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 a career, a potentially big career for me, especially being one of very, very few females who were doing it. Yeah. How do you go about writing, um, writing a set or working on, what's your process in terms of working on your comedy? Uh, because writing for sitcom is a different, it's a different style mm. of writing. It's a different, it's mm. a different approach, I think, um, mm. as compared to writing for, for comedy. So for me, it's, I'll have a conversation with someone and they'll say something and I go, that's a conversation. I'm writing that down. I'm going to try and write a set around that, or that's a punchline. I'm going to try and write a build up for that, you know, um, which has been a very difficult thing since, Locked out because I, I you know I'm not you're having, having conversation with the same people. <laughs> yeah, so the dynamics, man, and I actually find my best material that I wrote honestly happened when I was still using public transport. It, mm. it sparked ideas. You met so many different people. Mm. You went through so many uh, situations. It my my mind was busy, you know. And as soon as I settled into the nice life, writing got harder and harder and harder. Um, but I find that sometimes. Like now, I find that my writing now needs to come from my privilege, which is a strange thing to say as a black person. Okay. Yeah. But right now, I feel like I write from um, I write from a position of privilege, of uh, what's it being a woman in the socioeconomic situation we find ourselves in, and that's where I write from. I write from a place where, you know, social media has us now thinking uh, there's someone who has a rule book as to who and what we should be. <laughs> And yeah. now I have I have to write against that and go, well, this is me honing who the F I am um, and hoping someone hears me. Mm -hmm. And I find that my comedy as well now is no longer chasing the punchline, but it's change, chasing the truth. Um, it's a tricky thing. You know, it's a tricky thing. Like people are woke. People are. <laughs> uh, I don't know. People are I think it's like, interesting. Finding it's interesting. This. I mean, if it's, it's interesting hearing you say that because if you look, I mean, globally now, everybody, you know, it's like Chappelle has become right now kind of the the measure for, I don't know, any type of comedian, particularly mm. in the US. Um, mm. But for example, Chris Rock, even Chris, your Chris Rocks, your Richard Pryors, even Eddie Murphy to a certain extent, for me, laid the foundation because, so for example, mm. what I always loved about your Chris Rock was that it was social, for me, it was social commentary, but mm. presented in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that makes you laugh. Yeah. And, and, and it feels like Chappelle is now taking that to a whole different level, um, mm. which, which, which is probably, I guess, difficult for a lot of, would be difficult for a lot of comedians because you need to have something you know, you need to have something between the ears beyond just being funny. Right? True. <laughs> I feel like when you do comedy, just know who your audience is going to be and be, be at peace with it. Mm. Like, I don't, I don't like it. I don't enjoy an audience who, who doesn't, who don't want to think. I don't want, I don't like an audience who are going, why are you being clever? I, I, because I'm clever. I want to be, I want to be clever. I yeah. am clever, you know? Um, I find that because the comedian who made me want to do comedy was Richard Pryor. I sat there in tears of laughter and pain. And I was like, I want that. I want to be able to ride my truth like that. Mm. And with people walking away going, damn, you know, like I feel good, but I also feel like I didn't just get hoodwinked. Like, I don't know how to explain it. Like when someone's going, yeah, let's laugh because you know what? Life is rough guys, but we should laugh. Cause if we don't laugh, we're going to lose our minds. And that's that's where I'm at. It's like this whole thing with a what with a with a matchstick lights a matchstick and goes what's yeah. this and it's like when he when he lit his hair on fire and like it's. Yes. Yes. I, I, I have the one, the one Richard Pryor show. I can't remember what it's called, but he's wearing a red. I think it's like silk or satin shirt and black belt. Yeah, buttons. I ain't dead yet. And we wore out literally the videotape because yeah. I had it on video. We literally watched it so much that at some stage it it was starting to to burn. 
<laughs> and, I, and, and, ah. and, and it took me ages and I found, I found the DVD. So I still have actually have the DVD for it. Yeah. I just, I just got his book now. I got his autobiography. It was so hard to find. I eventually found it because it's like, there's so many books written about him. I wanted a book with his voice mm. and I found one. What's, what's it I called again? Because I've read three, I've read one that is, that was, I think his autobiography, but I've read three books on him. I have three books on this, him. Yeah. 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 But all my books are in storage now. So ask his. Because they are moving. <laughs> yes. Even as we want to. Even yeah, as so, we want to. So, so I was told that there's no space for your books. So it's been a, it's, it's been a, it's, it's been a moment. Sneakers, my sneak, <laughs> my sneakers are my books. I still have to figure out half of them are going into storage. And I don't know how I oh, feel wow. about all of this. Wow. Yeah, I'm going to be reading prior conviction stuff. That's me. You're listening to the Listen to Your Footsteps podcast. Conversations with Africans who are navigating this world on their own terms while trying to live life to the best of their ability. So in terms of, so I mean, there's the, so there's the comedy, but what I, and yeah. we really started like the beauty of you is that you're always you're always exploring other things. Um, yeah. How do you how do you now switch between those mediums? Because I feel like I don't. I feel like I don't. They they feed into each other. The first time I've done something that I feel is completely removed from it, to be honest, has been radio, because it's such a completely different way of communicating, and it's probably why I've stayed as long as I have because I can tell you now the thing that makes radio difficult for me is like I said my personality type is my I'm I'm happy and I want to play but also I'm a, I'm a I have this built-in rebellion in me I can't have a boss you know and so when you go into radio you go into corporate politics and mm. I don't give enough of a rat's ass to survive in an environment like that because the minute it starts to affect me I want to leave because it means I, I, I you've crossed the line you know what i mean because gender is slightly different we must acknowledge it's slightly different for you because you're going in as to me more like not a somebody coming who's like wants to be a broadcaster and and navigating that space so you, you also have i would like to think a lot more agency to to be able to go okay this is not working for me i'm out yeah Whereas, That's what I, yeah. Whereas somebody yeah. who's great, like you know, somebody who's and and I've met a lot, you know, a lot of kids, like they want to get into radio and this is what they've wanted to do their whole lives, and they work through mm. it and they get in at the bottom. And the bottom line is that they'll take a lot more crap than you would take, or I mean, even I would take. Like I'm I was surprised radio, how much crap I take. But I was but I, I mean, look, I was on radio as well, right? Um yeah. and I was fortunate enough to be given an hour. I mean, people always ask me about it. I'm like, well, I edited magazines and somebody felt, okay, because you're interested in all kinds of random stuff, it'd be good for you to have a talk show where you literally talk to people about this random stuff that you're interested in. And I did that for what, two and a half years? Mm -hmm. Uh, But then it got to the point where we're having a discussion. It's like, I'm enjoying this. I think I can grow in this, but... This is this, you know, this relationship is not working anymore. Mm. Uh, like we've tried different things, but you know what? Actually, mm. I think it's better if we both walk away so that when we see each other again, we're happy to see each other. We're happy to see each other. Yeah, right? As as opposed to as opposed to when we're in the same space, we're always looking in, in different directions. Like we're yeah. we're pretending we don't actually notice each other. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think I arrive and people have their own perception of what I am and who I am. And so it's it's unfortunate uh, that that's the thing that starts getting in the way, you know, because you start to feel stifled. Like um, it's such an intimate medium, Kojo. It's such an intimate medium because you don't know where the person who's listening to you is listening to you from. They could be naked in their bed. They could be in a group of people, but switched off because they've got headphones on. You don't Mm. know. And um, and so that was my interest in it, in, in telling a story, in building pictures, in, you know, building pictures, just using words, tone, 
volume, you know, and it's a, it's, it really is a fantastic space to play in. But there comes a point where then the censorship for me starts to choke me and I go, why am I still here? So the minute I start getting a knot in my stomach, I know it's time to leave, which is a horrible thing, you know, because it's like Jacka, for example, like leaving that space, you know, regardless of the big fire that had happened before then, the only time I decided, no, I really should leave was only when I started getting that knot in my stomach. Before then, I was like, no, man, I can write this thing out. You know, yeah. we're going to make magic. 10 years from now, we'll be looking back and laughing at this moment. But when that knot in the stomach came, I was like, no, it's time to jump ship. Uh, and I trust that. I feel like I've come this far in my career because I've always, when the my stomach tells me many things. And I when I haven't listened to it, I've seen my ass. Mm. So I've chosen to just listen to my gut feel and the only thing i find that slows me down is always going yo i'm giving up a regular salary how am i gonna make this thing up like you know and i'm now embracing the concept of free falling i free fall now because i go how many risks have i taken in my life and how far have i come pretty far yeah but so, it makes me laugh because because you you you're going in your in your mind you're going uh i'm giving up another in, in, well, a regular salary, but mm. you're always working. So it's like uh, the rest of us should worry about losing that one gig. Like, <laughs> the minute you drop that one gig, I mean, we we did what we did. We did. She's the one together. That was like yes, we did. you had like five things running. Like you're running <laughs> in and running out and. <laughs> I burnt out though, hey? No, that time I burnt out. I was doing too much. No, that time, shame. That time it was like somebody said to me, you need to prove you can. <laughs> and then I was like, no, no, this is enough. <laughs> Expose the <Kojo. laughs> yeah, no. But so I'm in, I'm curious with, with radio in particular. Um, you, outside of the writing stuff, uh, mm. I guess on the, act, the acting to a certain extent, but you know, Doing stand-up comedy, it's an immediate, like you were saying earlier on, like the payment that you get is the reaction of the audience. Whereas, oh, yeah. with, the, whereas with the radio, and this is something that I struggle to make sense of, like uh, you're sitting and you're talking to a microphone. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I was doing a radio show and I was interviewing people. Um, and at least there was that. Like I didn't have a co-host or anybody to bounce off. So there were moments like I'm recording if I was pre-recording like links, it's just me on my own talking to this microphone. <laughs> and it took me a while to, to get that. Yeah. But there are, there is at least one person out there listening because mm. I'd bump into people and they'd go, I really enjoy your show or they'd send yeah. me a message on social media. Um, yeah. But it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it felt very weird because because I'm speaking, it feels like I should be getting a response. Mm. When I'm writing, I don't mm. expect it, right? But when I'm speaking, yeah. it's like I'm talking. Um, I should be getting a response. Yeah. Um, I don't know. For me, I feel like I'm I'm in it, it's it's like stand up without the audience laughing with you right now. Uh, but not quite. Uh it's like having a conversation, man. And it's my two way, the two way in my head when I'm having that conversation is I'm, I'm imagining the person on my side and the person who's not on my side. And mm -hmm. I'm always going, I want them both satisfied. I want the guy who's going to disagree with me vehemently to have enough meat to fight with. <laughs> and I want the person who's got my back to be like, yeah, man, me, yeah, tell them. Because on top of that, it's happening in Setswana. I think when I was at Chakaranda, I, my comfort was that I'm speaking English. Mm. Once in a while, I'll jump in with the Afrikaans and I can hear it. So that's the only place where I had to be hyper-focused because then that was a language that, you know, was I was getting comfortable in. And then with with uh, now, it's it's my mother tongue for crying in a bucket. And it's a, it's a language that, you know, I, I find that it's in similar to like people who are very, very... Um, staunch about the Afrikaans language, but Swana, I like that. And I always feel like, okay, here's where you're not going to oppress me. You will not judge this when I speak because I'm from where I'm from. Mm. And when I speak, this is how I speak. So just because you don't speak that way, doesn't mean how I'm speaking is wrong. I can turn around and also say, you're talking rubbish. Mm. And so it's been fun to speak like that and own my space and own my voice and 
have a conversation because sometimes, and it bothers me that people dissociate sophistication from mother tongue. It's like the minute we're speaking in pure Setswana, we must assume we're only in a rural area. We're only mm. speaking to a certain level of education and a certain LSM. And I disagree. I believe that we are all upwardly mobile, regardless of what language you speak. And not all of us, just because we're in the cities, are out here wanting to be in it with the English. A lot of us still enjoy our mother tongue. And that's why we're still listening to stations mm. like that. And so I feel those are the topics and conversations we should have freely, you know? Um, and so that's like been a, a bit of a fight of going, yeah, but you can't claim people, this is above anybody's intelligence. Because when you look at the topic, when you bring it up, you're getting the callers, you're getting the social media uh, response. And you hear someone going, yeah, I'm a pediatrician in this place. And they're speaking like pure Setswana that was dipped in bleach. And I'm like, yeah, here you are telling me I must focus on the auntie who's just sitting at home in a peri-urban area. Here's a whole entire professional mm. giving us their opinion and they are learned. You know? Yeah, because I mean, like, sometimes I've listened to my sister, unfortunately, because I, 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 I learned it growing up in the space um, mm-hmm. because I don't speak it a lot. Like I realized that mm-hmm. I'm I'm losing like words sometimes, um, but the you know this idea that sometimes you want to tap into it. So sometimes I would put on the CD FM and mm-hmm. and listen to and listen to the football commentary. Yeah, and, I, and I'm only <laughs> catching like I'm catching maybe half a <laughs> sentence, right? <laughs> but just to be able to hear, be able to hear you know the language that I grew up with, like. One of what is one of my languages. Um, But I think also what you're saying about this, I, we create these stereotypes around, let's call it intelligence. And we tie that to language and we tie that to culture. Um, Mm. And when I was at Kaya, one of the things that I learned, like I would do a show on renewable energies uh, and then philanthropy and then watchmaking. Um, and then I'd interview artists and I had a poetry session. So it, it was literally just the full spectrum of what stuff that I'm interested in. Yeah. And when, so when I wrote the book, which you were so kind enough to say some very nice things about me on, uh, <laughs> but when I wrote the book and which is what the podcast is also titled, which is listen to your footsteps. Um, I was asked, so who is, who is my audience? Like who's, who's my, I call it community, not necessarily target market, but like who's, Mm. you know, who's my community. And Mm. I always say it feels like a cop out, but if there's one thing that radio taught me was that whatever ideas I may have about who that is, they'll inadvertently be wrong because Mm. I have been in the most random places and been recognized. And in the places that I assume that, okay, here, here, here people should know who I am. Like they haven't got a clue. You know, and, and I, I wrote about in the book, I once stopped at a petrol station, random petrol station. And I bought my stuff and I got to the till and the two ladies standing talking to the, the, the person serving at the till. And the one goes, sorry, are you coach of the poet? I'm like, huh? She's like, are you... <laughs> don't you do poetry? And I'm like, yeah. She says, no, I saw you at a business school or going to an event and, you know, the, the, the caterers, the, the waiter comes and stands next to me and goes, Kojo Bafu. And I'm like, yes, boss. And he's like, no, I love you. I love your show. He's like, I love you. Like, yeah. I love your radio show. Yeah. So it's, it's insane. So it's, it's, I guess it's being able to separate the, the the idea of intelligence um, mm. from the other stuff because just because yeah. just because you do something like you said if a domestic worker job had come up you'd have taken that because yeah. that's the circumstance that you're in you're going to do everything that yep. you can to ensure that you can better your life yep indeed stay hungry baby yeah well yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you talk about hunger. I'm still trying to figure all of this stuff out. Um, <laughs> you, I mean, you've talked about employ employ your 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 husband, and what I've always found interesting about the two of you is that, to a certain extent, you're in the same industry. 
Um, although, it, although it feels like Impo took the, uh, what's it? Like Impo's like the, he's like the, the what not Shakespeare? He's like, the, he's the theater actor. Like he, it's, it's, it's like he took the, you know, he took the, the he's purest. He's the craft guy. Yeah, he yes. took the purest yes. route, right? Yes. Um, yes. And, and then you, you know, you went and went to be funny. Uh, but what I've always loved and which I want to get a sense of is, is, you know, your work puts you in a lot further in the public eye. And, mm-hmm. you know, you have a family and you have three children and you guys have been able to just navigate that and make sense of it. Yeah, he's always been my biggest supporter and my biggest hero at the same time. Like I, I copied his work ethic. Because when we met uh, and I was, we went vets together um, and we started dating, he was working on the Fat Joe show. So Mpo was already working in TV when I was studying, you know, and doing theater productions, professional ones. And his work ethic, man, was impressive. And I, I just emulated that. And then I went into a space where, again, you know, I think right place, right time and my skill. I just, it's, I skyrocketed and I think it's because of the stand-up really. Um, but he's, he calls, he says my win is his win and his win is my win. And mm. that's the perspective that helps us encourage each other, not be jealous of each other. But also when that little bit of jealousy comes up, we're honest about it. We'll be like, dude, do you know how jealous I am that you get in this happening? Cause I've been hitting walls trying to do this. And it happens with the both of us. Like he'll get onto projects. I dream of getting onto to write on, you know, and he'll get it when I want it. Or he'll want to get into a, a movie or series and I'll get in and he'll be like, yes, yes. Do you know how I've been like kissing ass trying to get into this thing and there you are in there. So it, it's great because also we, when we share each other's frustrations, we get them. Okay. You know, we, yeah. we've known each other since we were just trying to pass the damn thing and get the degree adverts. So we, we, we know, we know the grafting, we know the journey. And so it's hard to envy someone when you know you're also part of that person's victory in that mm. journey. You know, we help each other audition. We we actually pass each other information. If there's a thing that's auditioning and he hasn't heard about it, I'm like, yo, did, is your agent putting you on this? Same thing, you know? Um, so I don't know. It's like we're just, we've remained the friends we were before we started dating. And we're always trying to push each other. Like our agenda is to put each other on. That's always been the agenda. And that's how that's how it continues. And we take turns. Like there, there are times when we go, yeah, we're taking turns. And he'll say, babe, I have this intense time coming up. And I think it's going to be your turn to kind of slow down a little bit. And that's mm. when I know, okay, I'm going to back off a little bit. I mean, he did that for me in the most important time in my career when I was starting out was when I got an opportunity to perform in Cape Town. It was going to be a residency of about a month and a half. And we had just had our first child. And so I was like, I can turn it down because, you know, it's our baby. And he said, no, I can write from Cape Town. I can do voice work in Cape Town. We mm. are all going so that you can be a mom and be my wife and still do your thing. And to this day, it's something I, I value so much, you know? And that's why even when the move to America came up with him, I jumped on and I supported him because it's, it means everything to me that he chases his dreams and achieves them. And if he doesn't achieve them, we know we tried together and we had mm. each other's back. Because then you don't fall. It's just a thing of we didn't reach that thing. Let's regroup and push for the next one. So, yeah, it's it's just teamwork, brah. Like, sometimes you are blessed. You meet the right person and you marry right, you know? Yeah, because, I mean, I've always, I've always loved that dynamic because I guess because import tends to be a lot more behind the scenes and, mm-hmm. a, bit, and a bit more of a chameleon with the stuff mm-hmm. that he does. Yeah. Uh, you know where he, he'll do things and people see him but unless you know him it's like he he, he fits into it right yes. whereas, whereas you it's because of the comedy and because of the profile that gave you it's we still we see you first before we mm-hmm. see the work that you're doing it's like oh to me is doing that work whereas yeah. whereas with import it's like import is that and hmm. 
I guess he, he submerges himself in a very interesting way. So because, mm-hmm. because you don't see, you don't see his side of things. Um, sometimes the assumption is that, yeah, well, you are, you know, you're carrying, you're carrying everything. But at the same time, like I, because we've, I mean, we've known each other, like it's then you are having to deal with, I'm not at home as much and the yeah. kids and yeah. the family and having that dynamic yeah. run. Yeah. I'm hoping yeah, you've gotten better at it. I have, I have, but this family would have fallen apart without my husband. Like, yo, he's the one who aligned all our calendars. Cause you know, the kids have their own calendar. I have my calendar, he has his calendar, but they are all synced. And we all know that's how we keep up with what's going on with everyone. And, um, we have a huge support system because a lot of the times as well, when I've been away, Mpo's also been away uh, on, on his work things. And um, his parents have been central. Uh, and, you know, on top of that, having live in work, you know, I had to do a lot of going, I forgive myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right now, this is the thing I want to push. And the thing I want to push is my career. And I forgive myself because I have put the best I can forward to allow me, which is, when I have those live in people who are paid well, who are happy, who, who I see through my children, how happy my children are. I'm like, this was the way to do it. And this great relationship that now the kids have with their grandparents, where they're like an extension of us. My in-laws mm. have become an extension of us in our children's life, which is fantastic. So it, it's great. And it's, it's communication. We, I, um, I suck at that. When, when, when there's a breakdown in communication, I know it's me. It's me getting, letting things run away with me. And as I've grown, that has improved, you know, but I feel that's the big thing that we've been able to talk about things. I mean, there were times, there was a time when our marriage was literally hanging by a thread and that thread was faith. And that thread was our friendship. And that thread was where we've, we'd been. And that's how we were able to find our way back to each other, regroup, reset and restart, you mm-hmm. know, and we, we move on even stronger. And I think that's the challenge when you when you married or in a relationship in the same industry, you know, is that you really need to be able to be honest with yourselves and each other. It mm. is so important because this indus- industry will even it will throw blows, bruh. It will throw blows at you, and you come home now. Imagine we're both arriving with those blows. You know, it's like so. Who gets to de- decompress first? Yeah, you know. And whose decompression is more important than the others in that moment, yeah. you know? And then you have these other creatures who need you as well, and they are not interested in your decompression. <laughs> they just want what they want. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a juggle. It's a juggle, but it's a juggle that needs you to be prepared to forgive yourself and be prepared to drop balls. Mm, I think that is, in, I think that, that being able to forgive yourself is such an important thing. Um, I mean, I remember there was somebody, it became my cheesy kind of sign off line when I was on radio. But after my father passed away, there's a, a poet and a writer, Bassi Ikbi, who's in the US. And her and I have been interacting for years. And I remember she sent me a DM saying, uh, what's it? Be kind to yourself. Yeah. And, and in that moment, I actually heard it. Like I'd heard it before. But in that moment, I kind of heard it. And it's something that I've always tried to remind myself of. And in, in that, like, we, we're never going to get it right because there is no singular right. Yeah. And, and we're all just kind of doing, trying to do, hopefully, the best that we can. So sometimes you need to be gentle with yourself. You need to be kind to yourself and, and forgive yourself. It's like, okay, I messed that up. Um, but, you know, let's move forward. I, mean, I find that especially with parenting. I think it, yeah. I feel like that every single day of my life these days, having a teenager <laughs> in the house. Uh, but it's like you do something or say something, and then literally five minutes later, it's like, Ish, maybe I should have done it differently. Ish. Yeah. Look, our kids choose us. We didn't choose them. So we always have to trust. We always have to trust. And just, yeah, when we drop it, ask us. <laughs> so... Just to close off, how, how do you decide on what you're going to work on? How do you decide, how do you decide on projects? Like, you know, there's, there's ample the opportunities or ample ideas. 
Yeah. Uh, there's some that, you know, there's some that are yours. Um, mm-hmm. So for example, like this podcast is something that's mine. So mm-hmm. um, I made the decision to do it, but it's also, it also feels like a mission sometimes because like, I know that for it to have an impact, I need to follow through on it yeah. every week, yeah. all the time, no matter what's happening, uh, yeah. which is hard to do. Uh, and then there are the things that come externally where it may be paying well but it doesn't fit in or Mm. it's not paying well although it's it looks really interesting so how do you decide on the multiple things that you're going to work on in a given moment mainly it's it's funny enough you touched on it is where's the effort going to come from so if the effort i know is going to have to come from me and it's going to be internal i am i will jump in right But when I feel like, oh, so it means I must now tolerate a certain person or a certain situation and I have to compromise more than I normally would, I wouldn't. Like doing other people's projects when I know I can do my own projects has for me to have the benefit of, am I going to learn something? Am I going to grow? Am I serving? Do I still feel like I'm serving? I love feeling like I'm serving. You know, to be in service to others is something my father-in-law has instilled in me and has made so important to me that it literally is something I've become conscious of. And so it's that. Is it service? Besides it being service, does it serve me? Am I going to come home hating myself and and tired at the same time because then it's not worth it? You know, and then there are those things I will do because I go, this is a bullet I have to bite. This is something I have to do so I can do what I want to do then I'll do it. There's some things you do, you have to, but it's the only way or it's one of the ways that's a means to an end. Mm. So I've learned, I've done a lot of stuff that's a means to an end. Um, and then comes the money part. Because then it's easy for me to accept um, less than what I would take because it's worth it as opposed to, um, I don't know, going, yo, pandemic is a panoramic we're in the middle of a panoramic you can't you can't be saying not to work it's a panoramic i've turned work down work because of the attitude with which it was offered mm. not because the person was just offering me too little you know um i mean i've had a lady who, who literally said well if you don't need the money and i was like mm, that's not how you negotiate hey yeah when you say well you don't it means you think you offering me this gig is is you're doing me a favor and I don't see work as a, as a favor. It's an opportunity. You and I need to see an opportunity here. Yeah. And then we don't do it. I did work recently with Leon Schuster. And there was this whole thing of, aren't you scared of being canceled? Aren't you scared of being canceled? I'm like, number one, cancel culture is problematic, but I'm not going to get into that. Number two, from childhood, this is for me. This has been one of the things, if you say you love comedy, this is one of the people you've always said, I want to do something with this guy. And I was like, here, yeah, we are playing. Here, yeah, it's not him with his problematic race things. This is the man. And I'm going to play here because we can write people off completely, but we cannot also ignore some of the thing, the, the good work that they've done. I feel like we like to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I did it going, I feel like doing a proper South African film, classic slapstick comedy. I've never had the opportunity to do slapstick. And it's Leon Schuster. Say what you will about him now, because Americans taught you about wokeness. I'm going to do this project. And I enjoyed it. Well, we'll see. We will decide how far you strayed once we watch it. You are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome. I just feel like we also need to stop pussyfooting and living this horrible life of being careful and scared. You know, we can't all be afraid of these constant guns being pointed at us by Twitter. I, guys, you cannot be living... Oh, why, guys? We can now, now not be slaves of hashtags. Oh, why? I refuse. As long as I'm happy and resolute in what I'm doing and my children's school fees is paid and we're eating, I'm happy, guys. How many times have we called people? Yeah, this one sold out, this one sold out. And then we're talking nonsense about them. There they are moving on, progressing <laughs> in life. And then they release their next thing and you are into it because you're like, <laughs> you've forgotten you sold down mm. and you were angry last week. Look, my, so, measure's, my, my measure has always been, do I feel like it's in line with my values or not? Yes, uh, that's and, important. And, and, and that's, my, that's my internal compass. Um, but isn't it's, that it's, that thing, the inside? Yeah, yes, that's what I was it's, saying. It's, it's, it's not the it's, energy. Yeah, it's not a, it's not, 
it's not what other people say it is, yes. but it's, you know, it's, it's my internal compass. And I mean, I'd, uh-huh. I, I wrote about this in the book, like give you an example of R. Kelly. Like I stopped listening to R. Kelly three, four years, well, probably about three years before Dream Hampton did the documentary series that everybody watched. And that's just because mm-hmm. I, I read some stuff. And, and I read some stuff and I read some more stuff and I got to the point where I was just like, do you know what? It doesn't feel, it doesn't sit it doesn't well with right. me. Yeah. So I'm not going to announce it to the world. I'm not going to go on yeah. a say, but it was just like, okay, yeah. I feel it's out of line with my personal values. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like you, sometimes I do this what, influenza thing. Um, yes. and, and literally I'll look at something and I go, does it make sense or doesn't it make sense? Uh, and, and I had a... Ish. I had an argument with somebody, well, argument. I was approached to do something and they, they were like, okay, so we want you to cook a meal and host a conversation. And I'm like, yeah. When it comes to the kitchen, I like, I, I mean, I could, I could probably go in there and do something, but mm. it's not, you know, it's not the thing that I'm good at, comfortable at, have talked about. Like, if you want me to come and eat something, like, they, I can talk about, you know, I can talk about tastes and flavors and they, yeah, the eating I can do. And I had a friend saying, but it's, it's virtual. Like we'll help you. We'll set it up. And I'm like, no. Mm-mm. So I emailed them back. You I and like, I. I was like, I, sh- I, I like it, but I, I, I need the money. Like I haven't been working as a consultant and as a freelancer, but Mm-mm. just cook stuff for the sake of cooking. I can't help you there. It's so weird. We're in the same WhatsApp group because the stuff I've turned down is about cooking. And I've literally gone, I hate cooking. Sorry. It's not, no, I'm not going to be comfortable. No, I don't want to cook. I, mm, no. And also anything that needs me to pretend to be a proper sleek queen who has the energy for the nails and the heels and the fancy outfits. No, no. Like there's me. I'm fun. I'm fun. I like to be fun. Actually, I've realized I'm, I'm two things and there's nothing in between. I'm fun. But I'm also very serious and deep when it comes to my issues and women issues. Mm. Like there are times where I do I don't want to be fine because I've realized I have an opinion and I need it to be understood. I actually have an op- I'm a comedian and you listen to me when I'm making funny, but I also have very serious opinions. Yeah. And when I'm putting those things down, you need to take me seriously and don't you dare dismiss me as a comedian and go up, ah, address the funny in that. Because in this moment, I'm being real with you. It's really important to me, you know. Because we live in a world yeah. where everything everything is it's like singular, it's either or. But yes. as human beings, we're not either or, right? So Why not, you, you can be a comedian, you can be funny, mm. but you can also mm. have an opinion and you could also be yeah. extremely serious, etc. And it's mm. it's it's the spaces that we choose to we sh- choose to share the different aspects of who we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. We could probably go on forever. You must go. Hey, we your, could. You must go to your next job. <laughs> <laughs> My next job is a nap today. Actually, I've decided because I've got a very, very ridiculous schedule going into the thirty-first of October. So, okay, no, go take your nap. Thank you for listening to the Listen to Your Footsteps podcast. This episode was edited by DJ Man Productions. Show music from Kweku Buffum. Please do subscribe and leave a review wherever you're listening. And also please share with your friends if you feel they would enjoy this conversation as well as some of the other conversations that we've had. I'd also appreciate thoughts and or comments on my website, kojabafo.com. Have a great one. Easy.